Amen. Amen. If you are willing and able, you stand now with me for the reading of the gospel. From St. Luke, the 24th, last chapter, as we number them, verses 1 through 12, this is for us today, the word of the Lord. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood before them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home amazed at what had happened. The word of God for the people of God. God. Will you sit and pray? Lord, our prayer is simple today. May all of our doubts be removed. And may we have the courage simply to trust that which you have made known to us, that Christ who died is alive. He has risen as he said. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Who said that? Not bad, Neil Armstrong. A penny saved is a penny earned. You know, doing all right. Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. John Fitzgerald Kennedy. I'll be back. Yeah, the Terminator. You won't know this one, but I like it. I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Thomas Edison, yeah, yeah, not bad. How about this one as we move into the month of April? Read my lips, no new taxes. George H. Bush. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Who said that? Who said that? Jesus said that. Remember what he said. Easter is a challenge for me. It's a challenge to find a way to once again lift the clarity of the good news of this day and hope that if you are already a believer that it will help you be stronger in your faith. And if there is a person in the room or persons in the room who have not yet come to faith in Christ, that today will be the day when you have acceptance in your heart of what Christ has offered. You know, it's not just there in the ninth chapter where Jesus said he would be killed and raised again. Luke's gospel twice, way back in chapter 9 and then again in chapter 18, he said almost the same thing. For he, Jesus, will be handed over to the Gentiles and be mocked and mistreated and spit upon, and after they have scourged him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. Now, thankfully, Luke adds these words, but the disciples understood none of these things, and the meaning of this statement was hidden from them, and they did not comprehend the things that were said. Count me in that group. This is incomprehensible. Matthew's Gospel, 17th chapter, 
Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and he will be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. John's 14th chapter. Before long the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. John the 11th chapter. Jesus said to her, I am resurrection and life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. It's funny, people say things at important times. Important people sometimes, sometimes just it was the moment. And because of the, what was going on and what was to happen later, those words become part of our cultural experience. Now, mine are mostly pretty far back. The things I learned as a youngster. This is a day that will live in infamy. Who said that? President Roosevelt after the Pearl Harbor attack. I shall return. Douglas MacArthur. This was part of the fabric of the communities in which I grew, knowing that there were people who said things like, if we do not all hang together, we will all hang separately, attributed to Benjamin Franklin at the time of the revolution. People who said important things that coalesced what was going on, little catchphrases that we will remember for a very long time. Those things become important to us because they begin to frame what it is we really believe. The things that we believe are the things we act on. And folks had begun to hear Jesus say these things, but they were outside of their frame of reference. Jesus said lots of things. You know, John says, there's a whole lot more. John said, we couldn't write it all down, all the things he said. So this little bit of information we have in the four Gospels is just a small part. Now my guess is there probably was a lot of repetition. Probably the things that Jesus said in one synagogue, he probably said in another. But there were unique circumstances and there were so many things said that there was just literally an ocean of information and in that ocean were these small snippets where Jesus said things like that I will be going to Jerusalem I will die there and on the third day I will be raised again since that was hard to understand and didn't fit their frame of reference it just was swallowed up in the sea of the other things he said I don't know that had you asked them at the time of the crucifixion any idea what will happen next? I don't know that they would have known. We have no way to know. Things that Jesus said. The women were on their way to the grave early in the morning, the first day of the week. This is what's difficult for me. You like my white robe? I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like being the center of attention. And I wasn't going to wear it again. I, rare, I don't think I've worn this robe 30 times in 40 years. But then I the, got to thinking last night, this isn't about me. This isn't about what I'm comfortable doing. It's about what God has done through Christ. And if a little bit of, shall we call it dazzle, would help you be reminded this is a special day. Well, we don't even wear robes very often anymore, but I do today to remind you that this is a significant moment in our, our common life, that we are honoring today, remembering today, commemorating today, and trusting today what God has done in a most powerful way outside of any frame of reference any of us would have. Hence the white robe, and do you see the tie? Yeah. <laughs> and socks. And socks, oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jim Fulton. Yeah, yeah, I'll show you those later. Be That's as far as we go. <laughs> it is a special day. My tendency, and I, thanks Amy and Augie for reading for us, I, I I don't know what it's like to sit out there and 
be a preacher. Ron, you're back there too. Uh, it's got to be hard to sit there when somebody else is telling the story of the resurrection. When that's what you've done for many, many years. So thank you for participating today. And Ron will work you in here soon. In fact, if I falter, come on up. Now let me say this. You know, back when I grew up, we had three-hour Good Friday services. And people couldn't stay for the whole three hours sometimes, so people just come and go all the time. That's my plan for Easter next year. I'm just going to start preaching at 8 o'clock, and I'm going to preach till noon. You come and go whenever, you know? I have that much material. Do you doubt it? No, I didn't think you would. No, wouldn't that be something? So, you know, we have more services this morning, and when it gets to the place where you've got to get out so the next group come in, just leave. If I'm still preaching, just go, you know. Uh, I hope that won't be the case, but we'll see. Because as a preacher, I've always this battle within myself come to the celebration of Easter. I want to try to explain to you the resurrection. I believe that Jesus rose from the grave, and I want you to believe it too. So I'm tempted to try yet again to explain so that you will believe it. There is no explaining it. There's nothing to explain. It is a singular event in all of history. It is beyond explanation. It is a mystery that defies any attempt to prove it. It has been so since that first morning. When, as Luke tells the story, some women went to the tomb, surely overwhelmed with sadness and grief, ready to properly care for the hastily bodied, buried body of Jesus, whom they had seen executed two days earlier on the cross. These are the facts. Luke, in the last bit of the previous chapter, includes this little detail about the events surrounding Jesus' crucifixion. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed. This is after the crucifixion, when the body was taken down, the very end of chapter 23. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day, they rested according to the commandment. And then chapter 24 begins with these words, but on the first day of the week. This is a matter of faith. Faith in Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. It takes faith to believe what happened that day in the graveyard. Faith that was challenging then as it is now. Even those who were regular witnesses to the mighty acts of Christ who heard his word, who watched him care for those around him, even those who were closest to him and had that experience had difficulty with this moment. They were out early in that morning to properly care for the lifeless body of their friend. They had seen which tomb he was in. They, would see, they had seen how he was placed there. Late Friday afternoon, just as Sabbath began, Life is not lived in a vacuum. Stuff happens. A lot of stuff happens. It's hard to sort out which is important and which is not. Some years ago, Patsy and I were on a tour to Israel with Bishop Beshur. I don't know if any others were on that particular tour. It was a lovely tour. It hadn't been our first trip, but we were there with a bishop whom we highly regarded, and he was teaching us at different times. It was a wonderful experience. And then we came to what was the culmination of the tour. We were going to a place that is venerated as a possibility of the resurrection. There are two sites that are often referred to. One is the Church of the Holy Sepulcher right in Jerusalem. And for a long time, people have said, this is the place. But then back in the late 1800s, a British general who was also an archaeologist found a place just outside the walls of Jerusalem that matched the description. They excavated this place, and there's a, a couple of graves there, one that is uh, very, very much like the description. And it was a wine press. It was a garden. That all fit. And so uh, Gordon was his name, and they call it Gordon's Tomb. And it's a place that tourists go. If you've been to the Holy Land, you've probably been there. We went there that afternoon. It was the last thing we were going to have the bishop lead devotions, then we were going to have communion right there looking at the tomb that very much could have been. It might be the very place. Who knows? 
It was nice when we went in there, but it got late in the afternoon, the sun got down, then the wind picked up and it was cold and it was, it was damp. All of us had left our jackets on the bus. And the bishop, filled with a mission, started to preach. And he preached, and he preached, and he preached. We're all sitting close together and we know communion's coming and by golly, we were just willing to take it and go. He was filled with the sense of the moment, but physicality, cold, tired, at the end of the journey, we couldn't get focused on what was going on there. We could have missed the whole thing. You know, life intervenes, we get involved, and other stuff's going on, and profound things are said, and profound things are done, and we miss them. You think, one of these days I'll get this sorted out, and then the day passes, the week passes, the month passes, the year passes, the decades pass, and there we are at the end of life's journey, and we've never taken seriously what it means to be a believer in the resurrection of Jesus. Is that true for you? I hope not. But it is possible I've seen it. Thank God for Easter. Thank God for a calendar that brings us once a year back to a place where we say, Lo, I tell you a mystery. God sent his son into the world that the world might be saved through him. Luke tells the story. Matthew tells the story. Mark tells the story. John tells the story. All recall what Jesus said. He said it in a time and in a place with a lot of other things that he said while people were going through all the other things that life brings to them. Were they able to sort it out and say, that's important? Evidently not. How about you this morning? Have you figured out what's important and what isn't? Are you just caught up in the tide that is sweeping you along the destiny of your life? It's important for Easter to come. It's important for us to gather together and, you know, time's running. Rich mentioned this. Let me say this. We're, we're making big plans for the future. I don't know whether the congregation later this spring or early this summer will decide to go forward, but let me tell you, we have 1,800 people that are on the roll of this church. We see about 700 on a weekend, maybe 800. Last week, Palm Sunday, over 1,000. Folks, we're, we're trying to make space for everybody. We're trying to make a place big enough that we can gather everybody who's already part of our community of faith and grow into a larger community of faith. Not because we want to be a big church. We're plenty big already. I don't know all your names. But what I do know is that we have been blessed of God with the opportunity to stand before the congregation that is ours, among the people that are ours, and say, Christ died for your sins. Christ was raised again, and those who trust in this, well, these are Jesus' words, even though they die, yet will they live. We have this hope that does not disappoint us. So whether it was John 14, because I live, you will live also, or Jesus in John 11 saying, I am the resurrection and the life, these are the things that Jesus said that eventually people said, ah, oh, that's what he meant. Ah! Have you ah yet? He died for me. He died for you. That you do not need to bear the sin of this world that will drag you away from God's presence for all eternity, but rather have that sin removed from you, the shackles of that sinful life, the power of the evil one forever set aside. And that you might not only live a life in this world that is filled with the assurance and peace of God's grace, but when you come to the end of your life, you will know the truth. Those women were startled. I love that the angels, according to Luke, said, What are you doing here? This isn't where he is. He's risen. Remember his words, and that's kind of where we end. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. I can't prove this other than I've seen lives transformed. Other than a group of guys hiding out for fear of the Jews 
went out of the doors and began to speak to anybody who would listen. Do you know about Jesus of Nazareth, the one that God sent, who was murdered on the cross and in three days rose again and invites all into the forgiving presence of God for all eternity? Those early disciples, St. Paul, who we heard so eloquently quoted this morning, in Romans chapter 10 verse 9 said this, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Does it get simpler than that? Hear it again, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, say that with me, Jesus is Lord, say it again, Jesus is Lord. There, that's part one. Part two, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. If you believe that, you are saved. There is no explanation for this other than the one that John recorded in the third chapter. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Christ is risen. Let us pray. Lord, forgive us the ways in which life surrounds us, engulfs us, and sometimes the most precious and important things get set aside. Thank you for Easter that brings us again to the mystery of the empty tomb. And thanks be to God, Father, loving one, that you so prepared those long ago that when they were reminded, they remembered. May we never forget that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And if we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that you raised him from the dead, we belong to you forever. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.